So I spent last few weeks hiding out in a secure, undisclosed location, aka my house, um, dodging media calls. All these reporters were calling me up because they wanted to know where in the world was the young North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. He's been away from public view for about 40 days, and the Western media were hysterical. What happened to Kim? Was he dead? Was there a coup d'etat? Did the military depose him? Was his sister running things now? Did he fall off his designer platform shoes and break his ankle? I didn't want to answer these questions because A, no one really knows what goes on inside North Korea. It might as well be another planet. And B, who cares? Who cares where Kim Jong-un is? And for that matter, which Kim is even ruling North Korea? We're on the third Kim now, and North Korea is still the same repressive, dysfunctional state that it has always been, except now it's armed with nuclear weapons program. We need to stop focusing on the minutia of the moment and start thinking big picture. What do we want to accomplish with North Korea over the long term? And how should we accomplish them? But this kind of question is seldom asked, whether it's about North Korea or big pictures of ISIS, Ukraine, Russia, or Iran. Our policymakers are always in a reactionary mode. They are like reporters chasing the headlines instead of thinking about long-term picture. They, instead of thinking about what we can accomplish in the next decade or the decade after that, they're always focused on what we can do today and tomorrow, even next year. But we need to think ahead, and only if we plan ahead will we be able to solve at least some of the world's most intractable problems. At least when it comes to North Korea, I have an idea of just what we should do. I believe in the long term that we should put all our efforts to reunify the two Koreas. I, I believe that's the only way we can resolve the Korean problem. And I know that to at least some of you, thinking about regime change either within North Korea or just regime collapse in, of the North might seem unthinkable. But we used to think it was unthinkable when we thought about East Germany or for the former Soviet Union. Honestly, that's the only way we can solve the problem. Now, historical record shows that failed states cannot go on forever. And North Korea is the most failed state in the world. As a Korean American, this Korean issue is a particularly personal one for me because my entire paternal side of the family came from North Korea. My paternal grandparents, whom I was very close to because they helped raise me. Uh, my father passed away when I was very young and they helped raise me and I was very close to them. And they, but the, they were the lucky ones because they happened to be in the southern part of the Korean Peninsula when the Korean War broke out in 1950. But their family members were not so lucky. They remained trapped in North Korea. Um, and my grandparents unfortunately passed away without ever finding out what happened to their their family members, their moms, their dads, their brothers, their sisters, their uncles and their aunts. And I, I weep at the fate that my family had to endure, or so many divided Korean families had to endure, or all the North Koreans right now um, in North Korea uh, who are trapped in North Korea, who are basically prisoners for six decades now. I hope and I wish they could have had opportunities that I had, or 50 million South Koreans have. U.S. policy towards North Korea for the last 20 years have been quite simple, actually. It was all about trying to get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons program. And we tried to negotiate, and we tried to give them incentives like food and energy supplies um, just to get them to denuclearize. But while North Korea was happy to pocket the aid, they were not willing to follow through on the promises that they have made. So, in my experience, from my perspective, because North Korea has not willing to follow through on their promises, and they just kept on developing nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles to deliver them, and from my perspective, North Korea is never going to change. 
It's never going to transform itself into a country that its citizens can live with uh, or its neighbors can live with. It will continue to be the worst human rights violators on the planet. It will continue to be one of the worst weapons proliferators on the planet. So our approach to North Korea has been very myopic and ineffective. Only we, if we pursue, and the only solution is if there is, if either regime itself ends or a different leadership emerges in North Korea, leading to reunification. That's the only solution. Now, we have limited leverage right now, but it's formidable if given enough time. For example, we can do so many things, but first of all, we need to start by helping the North Korean people. We need to for example, information penetration. We can step up our efforts to bring in outside information into North Korea to break Kim Jong-un's information blockade. We can highlight regime's abuses, widespread systemic abuses, which the United Nations this year in a landmark 400-page report called Crimes Against Humanity. Like apartheid South Africa, North Korea is a moral abomination. It keeps hundreds of its own people in Soviet-style gulags, in political prison camps, while the rest of the population must confront malnutrition and even starvation. In the mid-1990s, almost two million people died of starvation. Human rights problems in North Korea constitute a core threat, not only to the people of North Korea, but to peace and stability in the region. And I would argue that this problem is as of a threat to humanity than as North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Secondly, we should also continue to put economic pressure that's aimed at the elites, uh, particularly going after North Korea's illicit activities, like smuggling and money laundering, to cut off the fund that Kim Jong-un uses to buy luxury goods and luxury cars and cognac and resources to get the elite support. We should also appeal to the regional governments, particularly China, which is North Korea's number one patron, to do the same. We know that China is not happy with North Korea. China is not happy with Kim Jong-un, but China supports North Korea because it wants to keep North Korea as a buffer. It, it wants to avoid instability on the border, and it wants to make sure that U.S. forces don't go anywhere near the border. So we could make a deal with the Chinese. We could even offer them, say, we will reduce U.S. presence on the Korean Peninsula, or pull out all our troops in South Korea in case of unification if they stop subsidizing North Korea. Now, many of you might disagree with me, it's okay, because many people do, uh, you know, Koreans do, particularly the younger generation who are fearful of having to brunt all this financial cost of potential unification. Um, and when you look at the end of despotic regimes, it's always ugly, and it's true that there will be a lot of challenges and problems associated with the end of North Korea, because it's a, such a desperate regime and such a so militaristic regime. There will be chaos, there will be disorder, there could be humanitarian problems, there will be refugee flows, there will be even potentially challenge of trying to secure loose nuclear weapons. But I do believe that with enough planning and careful preparation, United States and South Korea and our allies will be able to manage these problems. And if we manage the unification correctly, in a right way, there is a potential for real upside here a one Korea, whole and free. Imagine the benefit of freeing 25 million North, North Korean people from where they are. You can move, an average North Korean can out, get out of starvation diet, literally and intellectually, to the plentiful availability of food, information, resources, consumer goods, and other benefits of modern capitalism. So, United Korea would basically be a bigger version of South Korea. Think about it that way. As free and even perhaps more prosperous. 
unified Germany in Asia, potential economic powerhouse and force for stability in the region. The fact that we're not thinking about unification right now shows you our short-term mindset, that our governments are always thinking about what they can just accomplish this year and next year, and not what they can accomplish in the next decade. No official in a presidential administration wants to pursue a policy that they're not going to be able to take credit for. They might just, well, it might even benefit an opposition party if the benefits come out two or three administrations down the road. But we must start thinking long-term picture. Um, we had a couple of exceptions. For example, uh, we pursued containment against the Soviet Union, so containment policy. From 1940s to about 1990s, every U.S. administration patiently pursued a containment policy of the Soviet Union. Or think about international efforts to isolate apartheid South Africa. Um, eventually, all that pressure uh, and, uh, that paid off, and both Soviet Union and apartheid collapsed. That should be a model for U.S. or any other government's foreign policy. We need to set long-term goals and patiently adhere to them. And if we do that, I think we'll be surprised at how much we can truly accomplish. Even a problem like North Korea would not look so intractable if we set a long-term policy goal of unification and patiently adhere to it. Thank you.